Now, just before we start, I have a special announcement. It's a new Kilkenomics X event. That means it's in Dublin, not in Kilkenny. It's on the 13th of October, and it features Michael Lewis, the author of The Big Short, Flash Boys, Moneyball. He's talking to me in St. Patrick's Cathedral about his new book, which is called Going Infinite. And it is the story of Sam Bankman-Fried. Sam Bankman-Fried, you will know, was the chief executive of FTX, the crypto exchange that went spectacularly bust around this time last year. Now, before this guy was 30, he had become the world's youngest billionaire, making a fortune on crypto. Now, chief executives, celebrities, world leaders, they were all vying for his time. At one point, he considered paying off the entire national debt of the Bahamas so that he could take his business there. And then it all fell apart. And Michael Lewis was there when it happened, having got to know SBF, as he was called, during his epic rise. Now, this new book, Going Infinite, I'm reading it right now, tells the story like no other, taking you through the mind-bending trajectory of a character who never liked the rules and was allowed to play by his own. So if you're interested in economics, finance, crypto, boom busts, legal trials, what happens when companies rise dramatically and then fall to the ground, this is the gig for you. And it's an amazing story. So the gig is Michael Lewis talking to myself, David McWilliams, 13th of October, a Friday night, 8 p.m., St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. And the tickets are at kilkenomics.com and they come with a book. Do not miss this event. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is podcast time and Today, we're going to be talking all about the U.S. economy, and in particular, the kind of stellar employment rates that are being registered. You know, we were talking about the U.S. economy being the economy that refuses to accept a recession. When we did that a couple of weeks ago, so what we're seeing all the time is at every stage, the American economy is looking at the Fed, and as the Fed keeps increasing interest rates, the American economy is looking at them almost saying, come over and have a go if you think you're hard enough, <laughs> right? The economy is just saying, we're not slowing down, right? Yeah. And again, last week we saw really, really strong numbers. And of course, the stronger the numbers, given the paradigm that's at work in the central bankers' heads and in financial markets' heads, which is strong numbers, mean more inflation, mean higher bond yields, what we've seen is bond yields have risen yet again. The reason this is all important is because the world is heavily leveraged, as we talked about last Tuesday, when we were talking that nagging feeling that we have in the back of our heads that, you know what, maybe there's too much debt around and interest rates are still rising. Why? Because the American economy is generating lots and lots of jobs and that should eventually feed into wage inflation and that should keep inflation high. That's the model central banks are working on. And John, luckily, I'm very proximate to America. If I stand up here now, look out over the lake in Toronto all the way down, I can almost see Niagara Falls and Buffalo, which is more than New York. (laughs) I am in Canada, John. I am in Canada. (laughs) Another day, another hotel room. And a quick shout out. I've just done a gig in Canada. Quick shout out. I was just here to give a speech. I was giving a speech to the National Bank Independent Network, which is a bunch of 400 Canadians. Really good fun. Sounds fancy. Yeah, and I'm going to give a big shout out, big shout out. These are podcast fans from Canada. I bumped into them last night. I met them last night. They all work for this bank. They're massive fans. Oh, they brilliant. want you to come back, by the way. They want to do the double header, right? Defo, I'll give the speech the next time. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Tocheri, Christine Rodriguez, and Patrick Primorano, obviously of Italian descent. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening. But they want us back. Listen, thanks for the gig, guys. It was great fun. But, John, I am looking at something that's every time I see it, It gives me the willies. It's the CN Tower in the middle of Toronto. The CN Tower, until 1997, was the tallest building on earth. It was then surpassed by that thing in Dubai. Can't remember what it's called. So they opened Dubai, right? So the tallest building on earth. And at the prize age of 18, on my 18th birthday, I was working here illegally as a dishwasher in a place called Ontario (sighs) Place. Now, quite what my parents thought when I was 17 and a half after school, to say, 
okay, off you go to Canada. No visa. Yeah, no, yeah, no yeah, relations. Yeah. Nothing. Off you go on your Todd. Anyway, so I managed to days. find this job. There were the days, right? And again, my kids can't understand that you could actually walk into a country with no visa, with yeah. no plan, and eventually get yourself sorted at 17 and a half, right? But at 18, John, I decided I was hanging out with these Canadians, and it was my birthday. And the other thing I didn't realize about Canada, right, is that you, you remember me, I wasn't a big spliff smoker when we were kids, right? Yeah. The lads were, but I was never really into it because it used to make me yeah, really it didn't suit paranoid. You. Yeah. It suit me, it made me paranoid. I'd get really paranoid and I'd be sitting there in the corner. And because I loved yapping, I used to find stoners really boring because they wouldn't yap. You know, yarns, you <laughs> know, stories. That's why I much prefer drinking when I was a kid, telling yarns and stories and all that sort of stuff. And you'd be sitting there in Murphy's kitchen and everyone be stoned and everyone be quiet looking at the window. Yeah, Mark, we were all listening to the music. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it used to make me really paro as well. But, so I'm in Canada. It's my birthday. And the Canadians I'm hanging out would say, why don't we go for a drink at the bar of the CN Tower, right? Okay, on top of the CN Tower. Yeah. And because, of course, I'm Irish, I have never been in a building more than four stories high, okay? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know that I have vertigo, which I have very badly, right? Number one. Number two, I didn't have the balls because I was hanging out with these people for about a week or two to say no when they said, oh, we'll all get stoned and we'll go up the CN Tower, oh, right? Man. Oh, man. So we go down to the CN Tower. <laughs> I'm not confident enough to say I don't want to do this. I can just see right? I'm freaked out completely. My eyes are completely red. I'm totally stoned, right? And yeah. the girl that I quite fancied is looking at me, looking, look, he looks like a bit of a moron. I'm not going near him. So I, the whole night has fallen apart, right? And I'm baked at this stage. Yeah. The lift in the CN Tower is outside, right? <laughs> it's a glass lift that goes up to the tallest <laughs> building on earth, outside. I get into it paranoid and after the fourth story i realize that i have vertigo <laughs> so i'm stoned <laughs> i have vertigo and the thing takes about half an hour to get up to the top right? and i'm looking out at a glass lift and i can just be straight down so i am now sweat looking at that off you be quite sweat face. Pouring off me right paranoid to fuck <laughs> and i'm now looking at the cn tower here at 40 years later nearly I am still traumatized. <laughs> I can't look at the thing. So welcome to Canada, John. I am here. Fantastic. And I know what's going to happen to me is every time I look out around and I see this bloody tower, I will just be parachuted back, to use that awful <laughs> expression, to the summer, some summer in 1985, stoned, paranoid, illegal, impoverished, <laughs> and suspended about a mile in the air with vertigo. The worst thing. I haven't smoked a joint since. Rent. Oh man, it sounds like you need some therapy. Anyway, Johnny boy, we're up here in the luxury of Canada. What we're yep. going to do is we're going to go down to a place. I was asking a Canadian last night that was great. He was talking, what's it, I said, what's it like living beside America? He said, it's like really living in a really nice flat with a crack den below. <laughs> <laughs> great expression. So we're going to go to the crack <laughs> den. Paranoid <laughs> users. <laughs> Paranoid. We're going to the crack den. We're going to talk about America. We have a new man, a new economist on the line. Do you know Odd Lots, the podcast, John? Yes, I do. Yeah, it's really good. An absolute must listen to if anyone's interested in economics, finance, all that good stuff. So I got Joe Wiesenthal and Tracy Alloway. And I know Joe, and I asked him last night, I said, look, Joe, I'm here in North America. I want to talk about the American economy. It's perplexing me. Who's the man to talk about employment? And he said, your man is Skanda Amarnath of a nonprofit organization called Employ America. And we are now going to go and talk to Skanda and figure out what is going on in the American economy as I look up. Don't, petrified. don't look up. Don't look down. It's, 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 don't look up. It's exactly the thing. Don't look up. It's the CN Tower. Let's go to the States. Let's go to the crack den. Now, Skanda, how are you? How's the crack den? <laughs> Thanks for that gracious introduction. And uh, so far, it's going okay in the crack den um, as far as uh, how America is doing. It's a lively time in the labor market, in macroeconomics, in all things macroeconomic policy, labor market, everything included. Yeah, no, no, it's a fascinating time. So let's, let's I'm talking to you. It is Friday morning here. The American numbers on employment have come out. They look very strong to me. Yeah. The American bond yield has been rising rapidly. A lot of the world is looking at the Fed, seeing what's it going to do next. 
the whole thing will be predicated on the labor market and the strength of the economy. Explain to me, first of all, what's going on in the American labor market? So the American labor market has defied many expectations, especially for this year. So we were came into this year with the almost presumption that there would be a recession, that there was recession was in the cards. It was in our fate. There's nothing that could change. The Fed has was hiking aggressively. The Fed continued to hike aggressively through this year. And yet the labor market has proven to be more resilient. Resilience has been the famed word in financial market media this year, say, oh, it's so resilient. We thought unemployment would be 5% by now. We thought it would be 6%. I remember last year, many a famed economist saying unemployment would have to go up to 7% and 8% in order to bring inflation down. What's actually transpired is inflation is in the process of coming down. It's not all the way back to what it was pre-pandemic. But the labor market has held through this entire shock. And even today's numbers, I would say, are very consistent with resilience in the sense that job growth has been very solid. Wage growth continues to come back to something that looks pretty normal by the standards of pre-pandemic, and it's maybe a little bit higher, but well within the norms of the previous three decades. And at the same time, we're also seeing a really resilient economy in terms of higher levels of employment and labor force participation. So we did not see this type of employment to population ratio. These are all nerdy terms that try to get at the fact that unemployment doesn't tell the whole story. Let's let's go into the nerdy terms. Unemployment ratio to population. Explain that to me because these, let's get into weeds a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. <laughs> so the unemployment rate is meant to be the ratio between the number of people unemployed and the total labor force. Yeah. It turns out it's very hard to measure who is technically unemployed and by extension, who is in the labor force? Because there are a lot of people who are not in the labor force who immediately jump into jobs the month after they report they're not in the labor force. It turns out to be a very flaky definition. There's a lot of good literature that says this is not a very easy to understand definition if you're answering these surveys. Okay. What's easier to say is, do you have a job or do you not have a job? Now, yeah. obviously, for people who are in their retirement years, or maybe if they are in their schooling years, they may not be in the labor force for totally understandable reasons. But what I would really focus on are those who are, we call them their prime working years, their prime age years. Some people who are on the margins may disagree, but something like 25 to 54, maybe 25 to 64. These are the kinds of boundaries that help us guide whether you're employed or not employed, Yeah, can help us determine the state of the labor market. And those employment rates have by and large been at historic highs, higher than they were pre-pandemic. So okay. that's true in the US. And it's quite an impressive fact given U.S.'s generally poor record of recovering quickly from recessions. So explain to me, Skander, then what is going on? Because over all the economics I learned stemmed on two sort of basic notions. One was there's a thing called the Phillips curve, okay, which was that as unemployment went down, i.e. as more and more people got jobs, more and more people would demand wages and wages would rise. That was the first thing I learned. And most people say, yeah, Phillips curve, but we'll, we'll, we'll do with that. And the other thing is that there is some relationship between the rate of interest and the rate of employment. If the rate of interest goes up, people start to save a wee bit more. They don't spend so much. Companies retrench. And you know what? Unemployment goes up. Those two things are not happening. Explain to me what's going on. This is, this is a sort of a, a little philosophical, intellectual, theoretical sort of issue that America's throwing up here which is the labor force refuses to bend to what was known as economic gravity in the past. Tell me what's going on. You have highlighted two key causal linkages that are, I would say, oversold by a lot of macroeconomists in terms of their relevance to understanding the first part you mentioned, inflation. How much is it explained by the unemployment rate or other labor market measures? And the second point is how much does monetary policy influence the labor market. And in the United States, at least, I would say monetary policy's effect on the real economy is this kind of very flaky, unreliable linkage. It doesn't mean there's no linkage. It just means it's actually quite unreliable once you exit whether you can buy a home or not. So we know that the Fed has had a very clear impact on the willingness to take out a mortgage to go buy a home. Mortgage demand has quite considerably collapsed. Home sales have fallen dramatically. Home builders have responded by building less homes, which is probably not, not such a great thing. But these are all pretty easily connected to the Fed's policy. Okay, so interest rates and mortgages and homes, that holds. That, okay. that connection that holds. 
Okay, cool. But the Fed to the labor market, the Fed to the unemployment rate, very hard to pin down because there's so many things that affect, first, how the Fed affects even financial markets. That's not completely linear, I'd say, or something that is reliable. We know yep. that when the Fed raises its interest rate, typically other interest rates follow. But as you go further out in time, the reliability of one interest rate increase for the federal funds rate to, let's say, the 10-year treasury yield, we know they're connected because ultimately the 10-year yield should be some expectation of future short-term interest rates and, and some additional things. Yeah, it should be like, it should be like your short-term interest rate plus a risk premium is your kind of long-term interest rate. Sure. And so that's, wherever that's you know broad. the short term, that's, that's very broad, but it captures it, right? And yeah. if you know where the short term interest rate is today, and you know it's not being cut drastically, your long term interest rate should be in some ballpark of the short term interest rate. What has transpired of the last until very recently, was we had a very inverted yield curve, we still have an inverted yield curve, but less abnormal, was one in which long term interest rates reflected a view that the Fed was going to have to cut rates at some point, the Fed was going to uh, be forced by recession. The Fed was going to address inflation. The Fed would cause a recession. And when the recession was caused, interest rates would fall. That story is not quite playing out exactly the way I'd say a lot of financial market consensus assumed. And what we have seen is right now the federal funds rate is 5.33%. The 10-year yield has moved up pretty dramatically, but is actually still below that interest rate. It is uh, four point, about 4.85, 4.9% as we speak. So just to stop you, so that's what we mean by an inverted yield curve. The short-term interest rate is higher than the long-term interest rate. Correct. Okay, good. Let's go. Right. And so that itself, if you think about why bond markets themselves, which are supposed to be the most attentive to what's going on with the Fed, <laughs> have not even processed everything the Fed has done until very recently, I would say. And even now, there, maybe there's more to process. But it's quite astounding that even the people who are paid the most to understand these things they're not exactly following these nice scientific linear processes by which, okay, the Fed raises interest rates by 25 basis points. Maybe it has an effect on the 10 year by 20 basis points. This is, there are no ironclad laws here, right? There, this is not the laws of, this is not Newtonian laws of motion. Yeah. And so there's that, that part. And then when you think about how those bond yields affect other bond yields, like corporate bond yields, you think about every single company that has a cost of capital, what cost of capital they face in terms of equity financing, debt financing. And those are important signals but there are signals that are moving at various points in time in somewhat unreliable ways. So how does that then affect the labor market? So those two things, the connection between them are long and variable is sort of the common word that's used in monetary policy. I think this has been a very instructive <laughs> lesson that no matter all the fancy footwork that financial market participants do, there are still many ways in which long and variable materializes. It turns out people are not perfectly forward-looking in ways that are easily captured by, okay, the Fed does X and the market does Y and an employer does Z. Like these things are, there's a lot of room for things to move around between them. Well, it's interesting, Skander, that the strapline of this podcast is to understand the economy, you've got to understand human nature. And what you've just actually told us here is that humans are messy and humans are weird and they don't do what we want and they do crazy things they fall in love and they make irrational decisions and they say bond yields up well hold on a second i'm actually i'm optimistic about something here so what you're saying is the great black box that is macroeconomics is messy it's unpredictable and it's not necessarily the sort of thing that behaves the way you want it to behave when you want it to behave that way and that's what we're seeing in the united states at the moment 100% yeah, you have to appreciate the level of uncertainty and complexity and how these things interact. It doesn't mean we know nothing, but I do think humility is generally a very strong principle to adhere to. Unfortunately, it's not well practiced by all. <laughs> that is absolutely right. And I could say that our, our tribe, the economists, humility and economics don't necessarily make very interesting bedfellows. I'm thinking of Larry Summers as, 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 you, as you speak. Larry Summers, if you don't know, Guys, was is one of the big beasts of the economics world. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary, head of uh, Harvard, I believe, all around big brainy lad, and very much subscribing to the idea that unemployment has to hit almost double digits for inflation to come down. And if uh, if that doesn't happen, well, then the Fed is in a pretty sticky dilemma. The Fed is now in a weird dilemma because employment continues to rise. Inflation is coming down, but not as quickly as they would like. 
But interest rates are clearly not breaking the economy in the way they want it. So what do they do, Skander? What does Mr. Powell, if he's listening to us, what does he do? I think the Fed is, that is a very good description, I think, of where the Fed has been thinking for much of the last 12 months. I am starting to get the sense that the Fed understands now their job is to not break things. <laughs> that their job is not to cause unemployment. They, they, obviously, they're a political institution on some level. They can't say any of this stuff so bluntly. But if you looked at their economic projections, and those economic projections, people think of them as a forecast and a prediction. They're more like an intention. They're more like a view towards if everything went exactly as I hoped with how I set policy, where would the macroeconomic outcomes shake out? And by that perspective, the Fed has probably walked away from the there must be pain view and are moving towards a, okay, unemployment, if it just stays around here, right now it's about 3.8% in the US, if we can keep it in that ballpark and inflation can come down, that is what appropriate monetary policy is supposed to do. I think the Fed is kind of starting to come to the realization that actually do no harm is a very good principle to adhere to, as opposed to let's get inflation down in a hurry. And if it turns out in unemployment skyrockets, so be it. But that is a very recent realization. Yeah, it's yeah. very recent. You're you're, sp you're speaking to a recovering central banker. I've uh, it's, I've got done the twelve. <laughs> I've done the twelve steps. It's a one day at a time process. <laughs> but but very much in in my generation, uh, uh, central bankers who were my vintage and younger were very much of the school that inflation need to be bring, brought down as quickly as possible if it spiked up and nothing else mattered. Now what we're That's seeing right. is thankfully a slightly more millennial approach. <laughs> to economic policy, our Gen Z approach, which is, you know, relax, take it easy, employment matters, and employment is everything. What I find fascinating about your institution, Employ America, Scandinavia, is that you are wedded to your nonprofit that is wedded to discussing how we bring American employment to the maximum level. And this intri intrigues me because it's a new type of I mean, it sounds very weird for our listeners that I'm talking to an economist that I'm praising because this economist has actually made employment his life's work. Whereas one of the people would have thought, well, that's kind of logical. But no, that's, it's a very unusual, it's a new thing for economists to be actually focusing on employment levels. Explain to me how you got into all this. I got interested in macroeconomics around 2007 when I was in high school. In 2007, a lot was going on if you were paying attention. This is a time when the U.S. housing bust was starting to take root or take gain more momentum. The f echoes of a financial crisis, you could see them, especially in August 2007, was definitely an inflection point when it became more apparent. And yet there also was a lot of debate at the very same time about inflation getting out of control. Very similar discussions to what we've had over the last 18 months. Inflation actually continued to rise through the summer of 2008. And at the same time, we also had another phenomenon of housing going into decline, and the financial system being potentially exposed to a lot of risks attached to the housing sector. And these two things were diverging. And as they unfolded, just as a consumer of information, finding these narratives especially compelling is to follow, that itself was an education of its own. And it turns out there were really big effects and impacts on people's lives through that whole process. If we think about unemployment reached about 10% in the United States, and that undersells the full job loss impact because a lot of people did not get counted in unemployment, but had lost their jobs. They're treated as people who are not participating in the labor force. So that real, if you think about the welfare implications of people who do not have their jobs in the United States, we do not have exactly the most robust social safety net, robust welfare state, whatever is the optimal scale. There are a lot of cracks and gaps in the United States when it comes to that. And employment is at least a first line of defense. So that's a lot of pain inflicted as a result of bigger macroeconomic forces tied to the financial system, tied to the housing market, tied to how central bankers perceive the trade-offs between inflation and employment. As a fun fact, there's a lot of heroic memoirs from central bankers about all the things they did in the crisis, which I think they, they deserve obviously a lot of credit for on some level, but they also tend to bury that after Lehman Brothers failed, 
And there was a big panic that was very obvious that was emerging. They decided to keep interest rates on hold. Normally, you would think after a big panic, the thing to do is to cut interest rates. But they were so worried about inflation, even in September 2008. And so this is a place where high stakes decisions are made. And it's important to understand them. And that really attracted me to this area. And Employ America, our mission is centered around, obviously, to promote very strong labor market outcomes, but to really appreciate the role macroeconomic dynamics and macroeconomic policies play in the United States, especially in shaping what's possible and shaping the potential set of labor market outcomes that transpire over one, two, three, four, five years too. Well, I can best you. The American central bankers didn't raise interest rates, didn't cut interest rates. The European central bank raised interest rates as we went into (laughs) this. Uh, A man called Jean-Claude Trichet, a great visionary, one of the great French visionaries who had weaseled his way all the way up the uh, French Einarch system, got to the very top, didn't know anything else to do. Europe is about to go into a probably the most crippling inter-country bond crisis that the euro has ever uh, experienced. And you know what your man does? He says, ah, just let's raise interest rates for the crack just to see what happens, right? So we, we can best you on that. But I, I take your point. It's the long-term social consequences of unnecessarily high unemployment that you guys are focusing on. And for that, I really commend you because I think for so often, what you always had in economics was this crazy idea. And I, listeners might find this bizarre, but I remember, John, when we first started doing this podcast, you found it bizarre that economists would talk. John John has the blessing of never having studied economics, so he obviously <laughs> sees things much clearer than I do, right? But, yes. you know, that unemployment was a residual. It was something that dropped out rather than yeah. being actually the most important thing. And John, I mean, you know, when, when my dad lost his job in the 70s, I mean, Absolutely, yeah. the impact of that on our family and the extended family you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to quantify. And that's not just on him as, a, as an individual and his psychology and his emotional well-being and his state of mind that, you know, again, Scand, if you know that Irish fathers of a certain generation weren't the most emotionally open. So these things weren't talked about. So when there was emotional problems, he used to go and walk the dog, which was always shorthand for my head is melted. Leave me alone. I need to sort things out. But unemployment in our country has only now in the last couple of years come down to levels where we could be regarded as full employment. So John and I's entire economic life, unemployment was the single biggest issue for Irish people. And it's only in recent decades that it's come down, only in, in very recent decades. It's when we, so, when you know, we were leaving, leaving school in kind of mid-80s, Skanda, we just up and left. We emigrated. A lot of us went to London. A lot of them ended up over there with you guys in the States. But I mean, what is fascinating in, in the States, and this is where I think we should just focus this last couple of minutes, is that the United States has got to a situation where employment levels, I don't think, have ever been higher. And the rate of inflation is coming down, yet the central bank seems to be still, at least in its messaging scandal, fighting the last battle. It's still talking as if it needs to have levels of unemployment that are higher than this to satisfy their yearning to purge the system of inflation. Do you think intellectually we're at a tipping point now that they'll actually change? I think we're, we're at a tipping point. I think that's right. I think we're actually close to that. What the central bankers around the world are saying, and I'd say it, the Fed included in that, is a sort of kind of reputational survival. So if we had inflation in the 70s, is still the scarring memory and thing to avoid if you are a central banker today. Whatever you do, don't repeat what they did in the 70s. In the United States, Arthur Burns was the chair of the Federal Reserve at that time. There were a lot of things written about his tenure as if he was especially derelict in letting inflation get out of control. It also is all all that narrative was written based on the premise that the Fed had tight control over the money supply, which it turns out the Fed does not have such tight control. And that conception itself has a lot of flaws. Nevertheless, Jay Powell, I think part of the reason he talks tough on inflation, why all of the FOMC members talk tough on inflation, is because they don't want to be seen as people who made the same mistakes as those of the 70s. That shadow still looms large, but as you've kind of highlighted through the two key things you have about employment and inflation, the fact that inflation is driven by a lot more things than employment and there are a lot more things even that drive employment than where interest rates are. These two things 
may force a bigger rethink, both of one, what drives inflation, and two, the role of other policies in supporting employment. We didn't really mention this in this episode as much, but fiscal policy, that there are a lot of things that fiscal policy is likely done to help build in more resilience and help keep employment high. And I think that if we get to the other side of this, where inflation has come down even more more comfortably or more into a place where people thought it was impossible for inflation to come back to its target without the sort of labor market damage, I think it does force a bigger rethink about what's possible. And that would be, I think, a very welcome one. And just finally, if this is the case, if you're right and there's a rethink and inflation comes down, unemployment remains very, very, very low by historical standards, job creation is still very, very strong. Do you get a very rapid reduction in interest rates in the next 18 to 24 months, if this is the case? I think if we saw macroeconomic growth look especially strong, the incentive for cutting rates aggressively will probably be diminished. But I do think there will be at least some reason and justification given that interest rates are still historically high by at least by the last, call it two decades. There are collateral consequences both on the demand and supply side from higher interest rates, both holds back investment. It also does impose some additional financial stability risk in the system, as we learned a little bit earlier this year in terms of regional banks and their interest rate risk. Explain that to me. Explain what's going on in regional banks in the States and interest rate sensitivity. Because I think regional banks in the States behave much more closely aligned to almost national banks in Europe in terms of size and in terms of the, what, what they actually invest in and lend to. Right. So... In March of this year, we had two banks collapse and a third that was effectively given a partial say bailout. I'm not sure what the right term is, but they got bought out and then they got effectively closed out. Um, and in those cases, the key dynamics of relevance were threefold, I'd say. One was they had certain assets that were very interest rate sensitive. Interest rates had gone up. And so the value of those securities was a lot lower. So that itself was meant to be for like for, for liquidity purposes. So in a period when you need to liquidate some of your assets and your assets are not worth as much, that's a bit of a problem. So what were they? What were they? Were they bonds they were holding? Were they? Yeah. There was, so in Silicon Valley Bank was one of them, and so some yeah. of the assets they held were Treasury bills and notes, and the value of those had gone down quite considerably as a result of the Fed's rapid interest rates. So they did not have the same scale of liquid assets to be able to meet the needs of depositors that they were projected to have. Depositors themselves could see this alongside a lot of their own Silicon Valley Bank helped facilitate lending and had some loans on their books that were towards the tech sector. Technology companies' valuations do have obviously a very speculative component to them. And if the time value of money is going up, some of that speculative interest can diminish and so valuations can take a hit. And so if you're seeing this as a depositor, there clearly was more of a interest in potentially shifting your deposits elsewhere. But if everyone does that at the same time, and especially if you're not getting paid particularly high interest rates on your deposits in the US, you basically get paid peanuts on your deposits despite, as if people talk about short-term interest rates are at 5.33%, I can assure you there are very few depositors at banks um, who are earning anything close to that level of interest. Irish people will uh, will understand that completely because <laughs> our, our deposit rates are ridiculously low for slavery. That's right. And so that can catalyze a pretty aggressive shift away from keeping your deposits at a bank like Silicon Valley Bank. And so there was a run. And that run was kind of catalyzed as a part of the interest rate risks seep into that system. When you have higher interest rates, the risk of runs does go up if you're not raising your deposit rates in kind. And especially if your loan book and your set of liquid assets are also interest rate sensitive and you're not appropriately capitalized for dealing with deposit outflows. And so those exposed Silicon Valley Bank, while Silicon Valley Bank is probably an exaggerated example of what regional banks are facing, other regional banks also have assets on their books that are probably interest rate sensitive. They seem to be able to handle the risk of runs. But these are clearly headwinds that are the function of higher interest rates, create new headwinds for banks, and banks have responded in kind by cutting back lending. And so while this has not been of a critical mass to the macro economy, you can imagine if you keep interest rates higher for a sufficiently long period of time, then market participants and banking participants were expecting, sure. that imposes losses and that creates, creates more risk. So I think the Fed 
really does need to be judicious. If inflation is coming down, they have a, I'd say almost an obligation to respond in kind by lowering interest rates. It probably won't take the, so it won't fall like a stone if in the absence of growth weakness, but it will probably warrant some adjustment over the coming year. We're seeing preliminary signs of inflation really coming more firmly back to target. If those actually accumulate over the next three to six months, I think the Fed, I would argue, really should be cutting interest rates. I think they will, but they will probably try to take it slow at first and try to make sure they're not head faked by the data. So the ghost of Arthur Burns is, uh, remember we were talking about the ghost of Banco last week, John? Yes, the indeed. Of Banco, we're now talking the ghost of Arthur Burns haunts, <laughs> is living rent-free inside of the mind of Jay Powell. That's the conclusion. Skanda Amarnath, this was great. Now that you've joined the gang, will you... Will you come on again? I'd be glad to. This is a lovely conversation. Take care now. Lovely to chat to you. Thank you. Talk again soon. Skanda was really interesting there, actually. Uh, and there's, there's yeah, a lot great of stuff. voice, actually. Great new voice as well. Yeah, lovely to hear yeah, yeah. New, new, new voice. But a lot of really clever, hard economic stuff there that I was uh, I was struggling to keep up with. But the one thing at the end that he was talking about, which I find really interesting, and this affects banks in Ireland and an issue that has been rumbling on in Ireland over the summer, which is interest rates on deposits. And he was saying that because of the Silicon Valley Bank and was it three banks that... There were three regional banks went bust, yeah, between, I'd say, March and June of last year in the United States. And they were, they were even though they were regional banks, they were big banks, John. Yeah. And the, and the, but he was the, saying... the main one was the Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, and he was saying that what one of the contributing factors, not the main factor, but one of the co- contributing factors was that the interest rates weren't being passed on to depositors. And therefore, yes. people were going, hang on a second, I'm not getting as large an interest rate as I'm due, so I'm taking my money. And everybody yeah. took took the money. So it created a run. Unfortunately, that can't happen here because we don't have a choice of commercial banks. To, you're, to you're take your money. Right, to- John. You're absolutely right. So, I mean, again, I believe that if the banks aren't passing on interest rate increases and they are not, it is actually robbing people's money because it's not their yeah. income. It's yeah. the saver's income that the banks are taking as their own income. So it's actually, it's actually, it's theft, it's robbery. Yeah. And I do not know why the Irish Central Bank, particularly because we only have two banks, does not introduce a withholding tax on banks that are not passing on interests. Because what the banks are doing here is they are making enormous profits in the last couple of quarters, explicitly because they're taking money that isn't theirs, but the income actually belongs to the savers. Yeah. And what is the Central Bank of Ireland doing? Nothing. But it's supposed to be regulating the banks on our behalf, not on their it, behalf. Yeah. The interesting thing about regulation, you always regulate an industry on behalf of the consumer. You That's never gig, regulate yeah. an industry yeah. on behalf of the end of the industry. Yeah. But what the Irish Central Bank is doing is they're regulating on behalf of the industry. But this is also an enormous opportunity for the likes of credit unions to, to well, get people's isn't it deposits. Very interesting? Now, just so you know, the Central Bank of Ireland has been running a rearguard action to crush credit unions for the last 10 years. Really? Why? Yes, because it has decided, it deemed in the last crash, that credit unions were more fragile than the other banks. Now, of course, there's no evidence of that because they're right. all okay. every single bank in Ireland needed a bailout. There wasn't one that didn't need a bailout. Yeah. So they yeah. all needed a bailout, number one. And what the Central Bank of Ireland doesn't want is thousands of little mini banks, like credit unions, whereas we know, because it's a regulatory hassle for them, because they're deregulated, they want to wrap them all up into one big bank or a number of big banks, so they only have to regulate one balance sheet, not thousands of little ones. But what we know is that micro banking is incredibly effective, because at the end of the day, the credit unions know their customers. They are community banks, people banks, so there's a much higher likelihood that the credit union boss, who may well be a volunteer in certain cases, knows the people who are looking for the loan better than anybody else. I would have thought that that has to be an absolute essential 
in not making a mistake. And that's essential. But what they're saying is the credit unions haven't the financial savvy or sophistication of other bankers in Ireland, and therefore they are highly liable to make mal investments, bad investments they don't understand, and they will be prey to stockbrokers pushing products on them. And as a result of that, they should be not overregulated, they should be closed down and merged. It seems to me very, very spurious because you've hit the nail on the head. If the rate of interest rises, in the United States, American consumers can shop around. Yeah. Irish consumers cannot shop around because there's only two main banks and there's credit unions where the central bank is trying to actively discourage. All the while, the banks make money, not because they are financial geniuses, but because they're actually taking the income that belongs to punters, the savings income. And the Irish central bank and the Irish Department of Finance, what are they doing? They're as effective as me stoned in a lift going up the CN Tower, right? When I was 18. That's about as effective they are. I'll talk to you in a couple of days. <laughs>